Today the credit monster stirs. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. The ABS released their lending flow finance data today for July. And frankly, given all the rubbish that I've been reading from economists who've been pontificating that the nexus between credit growth and home prices has been broken, I was not at all surprised to see stronger than expected new approvals in the month. With the number of approvals rising 4.2% seasonally adjusted compared with under 2% that many expected, and the value of investor loans written rose 5.3%. However, just bear in mind that total credit growth hardly moved, so the total lending growth has been offset by higher loan repayments as some people prepare for the uncertainties ahead. Approvals are still down by 8.7% by number, and investor loans are 20.4% down by value. So, unlike much of the reporting that I've seen, it's important to keep a sense of proportion. Also, these figures reflect what has happened directly after the election, when households' confidence was higher. So it will be interesting to see if this continues ahead. Those watching DFA will know the importance of house price trajectory because it is driven by the rate of change of new credit growth. For home prices to continue to rise, more households need to be convinced to borrow more, despite the fact that we've seen high debt levels, falling income growth and a per capita recession. In other words, the government's strategy of firing up the housing sector is working sort of but the risks of asset bubbles and more troubled households ahead continues to build. The ABS said that the value of new lending commitments to households rose 3.9% in July, seasonally adjusted. The rise in new lending to households in July follows a 1.9% rise in June 2019, and this is the strongest since October 2014. And they said that for the second month in a row, there were particularly strong increases in the level of new lending commitments for owner-occupier and investment dwellings. Despite this recent turnaround, both series remained down from their respective peaks back in 2017. The value of lending for owner-occupier dwellings rose 5.3% nationally in July, with rises in all states and territories apart from Tasmania. And lending for investment dwellings rose 4.7% in July, with rises across all states and territories. And the number of loans to owner-occupier first home buyers rose for the fourth consecutive month in July, up 1.3%. This was outpaced by a rise in the number of loans to non-first-time home buyers, up 4% for the first time in seven months. And personal finance fell 2.6% in July, following a 5.0% rise in June, and was down 8.9% on July 2018. And in trend terms, the value of new lending commitments to businesses fell 1.3% in July, but was up 1.5% since July 2018. Now, of course, trying to interpret these numbers is quite interesting because you can look at the original series, you can look at the seasonally adjusted series, which essentially takes account of past trends over recent years, but I have to say that this year I think is not a normal year. And therefore, the season, the adjusted series, to me, doesn't work very well in terms of trying to work out what's going on. And then you've got the trend series, which tries to iron out the lumps and bumps. Now, I tend to use the trend series for my analysis, as you may know. And so we will do that predominantly today. But many of the people in the newspapers will be spruiking the seasonally adjusted series. But as I say, I think that there are so many one-offs this time around, it may not be a very accurate set of indicators. So I'll just go through the data in some detail, looking at the rate of change, firstly on a 12-month basis. And remember here, we're looking at new loan flows. So over the last 12 months, owner-occupied lending is down 10%. Investment lending is down 18.7%, but you can see that both of those are now turning towards zero. Personal credit is down 11.6%, and again, is rising a little. And that means that total household lending is down 12.3%, but is beginning to rise a little from its lows back in February and March. 
Business credit fell again and is now 1.6% annualised. And I think that's a big concern because we know that business credit is pretty weak across the board, particularly larger businesses now are borrowing less. Now let's look at that same data, but now over three months rather than 12 months. And the data gets a bit noisier as we do that, but it's, again, it's quite interesting and just to see what's going on. Owner-occupied lending is positive 1.4% over the last three months. Investment lending is positive 0.5% over the last three months. And personal credit was flat over the same period. Total household credit grew 1% over the last three months. And business was down 1.1% over three months. So again, we are seeing that business borrowing is under pressure. And if we look at the one month new loan flows, then you can see how volatile the information really is. So owner occupied lending is up 5.5%. Investment lending is up 4.3% over the last month. Personal credit was down 1.6% over the last month. And total household credit was up 3.9% over the last month. So a considerable increase thanks to the loosening of the APRA standards. Business was down 1.1%, but you can see there how volatile that series is. Now let's look at the household lending trends by type over the last 12 months. And here we can see that construction for owner occupation continues to dive. It's now down 10% over the last 12 months. Whereas owner occupied borrowing for newly constructed property is up, but still in negative territory. Owner occupied borrowing for purchase of established properties is still in negative territory also, but again moving up. And refinancing continues to show a slight improvement, but still in negative territory. And all owner occupied lending is still down 10% over the last year. Investment excluding refinance is down 25% over the last 12 months, but is now beginning to move up slightly. Whereas the refinance of existing investment loans is considerably higher. And that's of course because a lot of people are trying to switch to cheaper loans. And therefore all investment is down 19% over the last 12 months. And looking at the new credit stats across the states in more detail. New South Wales rose 5.4% over the month, but still down 8.8% over the year. Victoria up 3.4% over the month and down 8.9% over the year. And Queensland up 2.8% over the month, but down 13% over the year. With smaller gains in South Australia up 1.4% over the month and down 5.3% over the year. Western Australia up 0.9% and down 4% over the year. The average loan size rose in the month, with details showing gains concentrated in New South Wales and Victoria, with a notable rise amongst first home buyers. The number of first home buyers also posted a rise, but construction-related finance approvals were mixed, with finance for construction down 1.6% over the month, or down 14.6% over the year, and expect more falls ahead there, while finance for purchase of a newly built dwelling was up strongly, up 10.7% over the month. And this will include off the plan and purchases and recently completed development. This sector is still down 9.8% over the year, so I expect weakness in construction to continue for some time. But as I've discussed before, the continued growth in credit is a simplistic attempt to try to turn the economy around, but the consequences are dire in the low income growth, high cost environment. The concentration of debt in one third of the population means that the average debt to income is north of six times. So the standard RBA chart does not tell the full story. But even so, the latest chart pack reveals that household debt has risen again while home prices are falling. An unfortunate pincer movement. And the ABC has started a short series of segments on the economy. And last night, Stephen Long introduced the series and incorporated some good but worrying data on debt. And I contributed to the show. Now to tonight's special report and the start of a week-long series looking at the sluggish economy and how it affects each and every one of us. Australia hasn't had a recession in nearly three decades, but for those balancing household budgets, it doesn't feel like it. 
The economic figures last week were the worst since the global financial crisis. Wages growth is stagnant and inflation remains well below target. Stephen Long takes a look at the impact on businesses and the people struggling to make ends meet. In Sydney's Inner East, this Syrian restaurant is a local favourite. Tonight there's a smattering of regulars and friends, but empty tables are a sign of the times. We've been here now for 12 years and the last 12 months have probably been the most difficult um, by way of uh, customers not spending. At one point I thought we were going into a recession, to be honest, um, but I, I'd say somewhere before that doesn't look great from a business point of view. Her assessments on the money. The economy's growing at a snail's pace, the slowest in a decade. The same goes for wages growth. It's been woeful for even longer. The last six years have been the worst period for wage growth in Australia since the Second World War. On average, wages are rising a little faster than prices, but there's a catch. The price of things we need, food, healthcare and power, has been rising strongly for many years. The cost of things we want, a new phone, computer, a new outfit, has been rising by less or even falling. If you spend a lot of your money on imported electronics or foreign vacations or some other luxury goods and services, maybe your inflation rate was lower than the average. But if you spend most of your money on the necessities of life, you're probably experiencing a faster rate of increase in prices than your own wages have been growing. Carol's cafe is caught in the squeeze. You know, everything rises, rent rises, electricity, gas, all of that rises, but um, we can't keep increasing our prices. House prices aren't included in the inflation rate. If they were, it would tell a very different story. Despite recent falls, a home costs far more than it used to, pushing the Australian dream out of reach for many. Household debt in Australia is higher than almost anywhere around the world. And on some measures, we're right at the top. In other measures, we're just number two after Switzerland. And that mountain of debt makes us vulnerable. We've got a million households in mortgage stress, more struggling to make those mortgage repayments, and mortgage delinquencies are already rising now. If unemployment starts to rise, that's just going to accelerate. For years, the economy's relied on mining and construction, houses and holes. But both of those sectors have now gone from boom to bust. And right now we have very little of the high-tech export-oriented industries that we need to drive growth. I'm quite concerned by the growth in what I call the bedpan economy. You know, we've got many more service sector jobs in healthcare and aged care, but those aren't necessarily productive jobs. They're important jobs, but not productive jobs. And my question is, where is the next generation of value going to come from in the economy? A world record 28 years without a recession in Australia has involved some good management and a lot of luck. But with offshore threats like Brexit, the US-China trade wars and the risk of China's economy blowing up, can the luck hold? The powers that be still say the glass is half full. I agree 100% with you that the Australian economy is growing and the fundamentals are strong. Carol Saloom can't see it. I can't agree with that. It, that. Nothing feels sound or strong from our point of view. The hope is that tax cuts and interest rate cuts will top up the economy. But right now, the glass looks half empty. Stephen Long, ABC News. And the ABC also discussed the astonishing fact that banks are now referring people to food banks to help them to pay their mortgage. Food Bank South Australia has been approached by banks wanting to refer their clients to the charity in the hope it will prevent people from defaulting on mortgage payments. It comes as a new report has shown that mental distress is increasing in older Australians, with nearly half of all homeowners aged 55 to 64 still paying off a mortgage up from just 14% 30 years ago. And Food Bank South Australia said the fact it has been approached by the banks had shown a significant shift and Food Bank was working on a project to support those in need. Mortgage delinquencies are on the rise, they said. House prices are still tumbling 
and borrowers are falling into the quicksand of negative equity in their property. It's bad. We're getting inquiries from schools, pastoral care workers, from principals at various schools around the state. And increasingly, they said, we are now seeing inquiries from banks and financial institutions who are looking to try and find a way of helping their clients balance their budget. He said, and they went on to say that the program was still in its early stages, but they hoped that Food Bank would have a concrete program in place within the next two to three months. It may even be as simple as banks referring their clients to the Food Bank food hubs, but there would obviously be conditions to that, which would have to be assessed by the bank to make sure these people are genuinely in need of those services. Well, I think this is frankly an astonishing development, but it continues to reinforce the fact that those in power are using households as cannon fogger. I believe the bull trap is now definitely being sprung, being assisted by spruiking from the industry. For example, the HIA in their release today said that first home buyers are continuing to take advantage of a less competitive environment and more affordable house prices. The number of loans to first-time home buyers was up by 1.3% for the month and up 4% for three months to July. First home buyers, they said, account for just under one third of the total market. The continued growth of this segment is important for the broader housing market. Well, I have to tell you that that statistic is just plain wrong. Including refinance loans, it's closer to 28%. But if you add in investors, the proportion is lower again. It's clearly designed to push more people into the firing line and to apply pressure to the government with regard to the first owner grant. It'll be interesting to see whether this credit growth does continue or whether in fact the fading confidence levels that we're seeing in households, the continued pressure on household budgets and the general concern about the global environment and the potential recession from, say, the US or somewhere else starts to turn this more negative. I think that this may be just a flash in the pan, but we'll see over the next few months. In any case, I'll incorporate this updated data into our scenario models and in just over a week, we'll be running our next live stream event where we'll update our various scenarios and the outcomes. But I have to say that this credit monster is looking rather ugly just now. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time. Bye.